Fatima, and today I'm going to be talking about opioid addiction and how to combat drug abuse. So, before we start, a little bit about me. I'm a sophomore at James Logan High School. I was a Broadcom Masters nominee and first place in my category for the Alameda County Science and Engineering Fair in 2022. I've taken a course of social psychology at Ohlone College. I'm also a tutor for Algebra 1 and Geometry. And I've been an instructor for Audacity Workshop Summer and Weekly throughout 2021, 2022, and 2023. And I'm also a student athlete. I'm on James Lincoln's basketball and softball teams. So before we start, a little overview. Um, first, I'm going to start off by talking about recognizing opioids, in which I'll talk about the mechanism of action of our bodies, the, con the concomitants of consumption of opioids, and the various types of opioids. And then we'll move on to talk about the ramifications of opioids in which I'll discuss addiction and overdose rates and how that relates to psychological and physical dependence. And then I'll also talk about the illegal use of opioids. And lastly, I want to talk about how we can combat drug addiction. Um, I'll talk about treatment and how that can aid addicts and the FDA and DEA's regulation. And then we'll move on to some Q&A. So over the years, we have seen a bunch of news reports that regard overdose death rates, and the first one being Euphoria star Angus Cloud, who accidentally overdosed on meth, cocaine, and fentanyl. Not only that, but recently Union City Police have recorded five fentanyl overdoses in a day, and that also includes the death of a teen. We've also seen reports that tell us that fentanyl deaths in San Francisco have been surging, and the city is on track to surpass previous totals. And additionally, drug overdose deaths in evolving cocaine opioids have spiked, have spiked in the last decade. And not only that, but now we're also de dealing with teen fentanyl overdoses. And all of these news reports combined emphasize the emergence of what might be an opioid epidemic. And that's something that the world needs to unite on. So firstly, what are opioids? So what are opioids and how do they work? Opioids are essentially medications that are prescribed by doctors to treat severe or persistent pain, and that could be anything ranging from chronic headaches, patients recovering from surgery, or cancer-associated pain. Now, they can usually be taken in pill form, but sometimes they can be transmitted through IVs, injections, or suppositories. They attach to proteins called opioid receptors on the nerve cells in the brain, gut, spinal cord, and essentially these opioid receptors can be found anywhere in your body. Um, when you ingest that opioid, it blocks the pain signals that are sent to the brain through the spinal cord, and so some of the side effects that you can face are nausea, sedation, and euphoria. So there are various types of opioids, but the main ones that I will be focusing on today are heroin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, morphine, methadone, and codeine. And all of these are Schedule II drugs, which means that they're approved by the DEA, and the DEA is the Drug Enforcement Agency. And then there's one other opioid that I'd like to talk about, and that's fentanyl, because fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, which means that it's much stronger than regular opioids, and it's approved for treating severe pain related to advanced cancer pain. So as you can see in this little chart here, codeine and morphine are both natural opioids, oxycodone and hydrocodone are half synthetic, half natural, and fentanyl and methadone are fully synthetic opioids, which means that they're going to be more potent. And as you can see in this chart, we have codeine being the weakest and fentanyl being the most potent or most dangerous. Uh, moving on to how, how opioids affect us, the first way they affect us is through addiction. So opioids are highly addictive, especially when they're used for chronic pain. Essentially, when we ingest these opioids, the drug triggers the release of endorphins in our brain, and that's basically the brain's feel-good neurotransmitters. And what the opioid does is that it muffles the sense of pain and it enhances the sensations of pleasure, which causes us to want to take the drug more. So this is where the psychological dependence comes into play because the drug has become so central to the person's life that continuing to ingest the drug because it becomes more of a craving and a compulsion, even though we're aware of its harm. And symptoms of this could be depression, sleep disturbance, and social withdrawal. And now the physical dependence comes into play because uh, when we ingest the opioids, it leads our body to believe that the opioid is necessary for survival, and now our body depends on this outside opioid to maintain regular function, and we can't maintain function without that outside opioid. The next way that opioids affect us are through overdoses. So when a toxic amount of the opioid overwhelms the body, the part of the brain that controls the breathing is affected. 
and overdoses are primarily identified by shallow breathing and slow heart rate, which then causes hypoxia. And hypoxia is a condition where little oxygen is in the blood and lungs, and so barely any oxygen reaches your brain and the tissue starts to die, which could potentially lead to death. This can have long-term or per long-term permanent psychological um, effects, and that can include being in a coma, brain damage, or, or death. So essentially, when you start taking these medications, you feel the need to increase the dose, and you keep increasing the dose to the point where that same amount, where that same dose stops working. And this could be both a mental and physical, physical problem because as you start taking more doses, the pain threshold of your body increases, so you need higher doses of that same drug to the point where you keep increasing that drug and your CNS start, stops working. So the CNS is a central nervous system, and when your CNS stops working, that slows down your ability to think, and it slows down breathing, which obviously could lead to death. So as you can see in this little graph here, we have opioid addictions, and death, we're talking deaths per 100,000, and so we're going above 24,000 deaths here. Just from 1999 to 2021. So moving on to statistics, um, in this first graph here, according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, also the NIDA, more than 106,000 people died from drug overdoses in the US alone. I'm talking from 1999 to 2021, there has been a significant increase, and I'm talking um, in terms of both male and female. And the CDC also states that the rate of overdose deaths in the U.S. has increased from 14% from 2020 to 2021. And the latest CDC report also indicates that an estimated 187 people die daily of opioid overdoses. So moving on to talk about the illegal use of opioids. So fentanyl, which I talked about before, is the most potent opioid, and it's 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin or prescription opioids. And so you use it to adulterate other street drugs like cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine. And these are all Schedule One drugs, which means that they're highly addictive, but they don't have any good medical use, so that's why, um, that's why pharmacists don't really prescribe them for patients. They're also sold in forms like pills, powders to sniff, small candies, eyedroppers, or, or nasal sprays, and this is essentially what has spiked overdose death. Um, recently, actually, on September 6, 2023, the Union City Police recorded five fentanyl overdoses within a 24-hour period, out of which two of them died and three others were treated. Um, in this first graph over here, according to the National Center for Health Statistics, fentanyl alone has caused 21,000 deaths. So that blue line, that represents the amount of deaths that fentanyl has caused. And overdose threats, deaths associated with fentanyl have increased from 46.6 per million in 2016 to 178 per million in 2021, which results in a 282% increase, which is quite a significant increase considering that we're only talking in just our nation. Moving on to talk about how we can combat drug addiction. So the first way that I'd like to talk about is through treatments. So we have medications, including buprenorphine, which is commonly known as brand name Narcan, or its generic name Naloxone, and methadone. These two are used as treatments. So Narcan is essentially the drug that counteracts the effects of, over, of the overdose by competing for the same factors that the drug works upon. So for example, when someone overdoses, the first responders, they're going to use Narcan to counteract the effect of the opioids. And methadone is, basically a synthetic opioid antagonist that eliminates the withdrawal symptoms and it relieves the drug cravings by acting upon the opioid receptors in our brain. And these are the same receptors that the heroin, morphine, and other pain medications activate. And methadone and buprenorphine both have a slow process in its treatment, and so that ensures that the treatment doses, they don't produce euphoria for patients who are opioid dependent. And buprenorphine is similar to methadone, except for the fact that it's a partial opioid antagonist with a ceiling effect for respiratory depression at higher doses. A ceiling effect is basically when the dosage of a partial agonist is increased, there is little to no increase in effects. So essentially what we're talking is that you can't get addicted to that drug. And then the next thing I'd like to talk about is the FDA and DEA. So the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration, and it's a regulation authority that has oversight of all the drugs produced in the US. So when drugs are made by manufacturers, they have to present the drugs to the FDA for a seal of approval, and the FDA then studies the drug to make sure that it's okay to be put out into the market. 
Then we have the DEA, which is the Drug Enforcement Administration, and most pharmacies like CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, they're all controlled by the DEA, and they ensure that the drugs are dispensed through proper channels. Essentially what they do is that they guarantee that Schedule 2, 3, 4, and 5 drugs are not counterfeited, so the fentanyl can't be sold in liquids or bubbles. There okay. Um, now I'd like to talk about the subjectivity regarding pain. So essentially there's no test in the world that can actually prove that any pain exists in the body. So that subjectivity causes people to request drugs, which just results in the doctors and pharmacists prescribing any medication. And whether these patients are in extreme pain or not, we can't tell. So what I think that doctors should do is that they should provide a proper diagnosis to make sure that the pain medication that they're prescribing is warranted for that pain. And the DEA should monitor a doctor's prescribing habits, which, and I'm talking about the quantity of prescriptions that they give up. And because if the doctors prescribe a lot of, a lot of prescriptions, that means that they're just openly giving out these medications for which the pain might not even be warranted. And I also believe that the maximum daily limit should be recognized per drug, which means that they shouldn't be prescribing more than what's needed for that patient. And they shouldn't prescribe drugs above the minimum effective dose. So if you can see this little chart here, we have a positive and negative effect. So the, if we're giving an optimal quantity, you're going to have a positive effect. But as soon as you start giving more than what is needed for the body, you get diminishing returns to the point where the quantity and the effect is going to be harmful. So, how can each one of us help? Obviously, we're not part of the DEA, nor are we part of the FDA. So, if you or someone you know is struggling with addiction related to drugs, you can call SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. I've provided the number here. And essentially, they're available 24-7, and they provide free confidential treatment referral and information regarding mental or substance use disorders and prevention and recovery. Not only that, but we can also create psychotherapeutic interventions, and that includes motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, behavioral family counseling, and mutual health groups. Essentially, we want everyone to feel included and know that there's someone there for them to help, and we can create community coalitions to work across sectors dealing with inappropriate drug abuses. Essentially, this global opioid crisis can't be fixed by one person alone, and the world, the world has to unite for this cause. Okay, thank you. Um, I cannot take any questions. Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, I have a bunch of questions. Uh, how did the opioid uh, crisis start? Where um, is the illegal opioid coming from? So essentially what the opioid, it comes from this plant, and this plant is available, it's kind of like marijuana, where you can create marijuana from that plant, and what people do is they essentially start taking that plant, they make it, and so it's, easily available to be put out into the market. And so people get money from selling it, and so that's why the price is great. Okay, so um, there are two, uh, two, two parts part of the blame, uh, blaming the, uh, the, the drug makers uh, for pushing these uh, uh, substances uh, to the medical uh, community. And then instead of blaming the medical community for pushing these substance to the patients, which makes the spread. Who do you think we should blame? Um, I don't think, I feel like primarily the blame should be put on the people that create those opioids and who like use them to make street drugs like cocaine and heroin because they shouldn't be doing that. But then again, it's also, I feel like it's also the doctors and the FDA and DEA's fault as well because they know that the opioid crisis is a big deal, but they're not taking it seriously because they know that pharmacists are just openly giving out prescriptions for pains that aren't even warranted, and patients come to them saying that they're in extreme pain. But pharmacists, some strong pharmacists, don't take the don't, they don't take the measures to properly warrant that pain and assess whether that pain is actually warranted for the prescription that they're giving out. So I think it's a mix of both people. Yes. All right. Thank you.